Hello, and welcome to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in business and in life and simplify it. Now, friends, I am so thrilled. Now, when I say thrilled, I truly mean I am so thrilled. Okay, I'm gushing at this point to have my guest here today. Uh, This gentleman that's sitting across from me right now, his name is Dr. Gary Chapman. He's the author of the well-known book, The Five Love Languages, The Secret to Love That Lasts. And he's spoken to thousands of people around the world, helping couples learn how to nurture a healthy relationship with each other. With a healthy dose of humor, Dr. Chapman gives valuable tips on breaking unhealthy patterns and choosing to develop healthy relationships. Married for 50 years, and I'm pulled to the same woman. That's good. (laughs) That's right. And has 40 years of marriage counseling experience under his belt. Dr. Chapman has a passion for people and helping them form lasting relationships. I'd like to welcome to the Simplifiers podcast today, Dr. Gary Chapman. Hello. Well, thank you, Mary. It's good to be with you. I am so glad you're here. And it's such a delight, too, because you are actually speaking here later this evening at my local church, uh, Trent Vineyard, here in Nottingham, England, which is a delight to find another Southerner here on the (laughs) other side of the pond. And I said, oh, I have to talk to Gary immediately. (laughs) Now, when I say that your book has fundamentally helped my marriage and my the way I relate to my coworkers, the way I parent my kids... It is not, like, that's the understatement of the year. Mm. Like, your book, Five Love Languages, is brilliant, bottom line. And I hope that you don't mind me gushing with that. But I really wanted to bring you on the podcast today to simplify what the five love languages are and why you think that is so important as a message to get out to the world. Well, I think the reason it's so important is that almost everyone agrees Our deepest emotional need on the human level Mm. is to feel loved by the significant people in our lives. If you're married, that's your spouse. If you have children, it's the parent-child relationship. But in all of our significant relationships, if we feel loved and appreciated by the other person, the relationship goes forward. But if we don't feel loved and appreciated, the relationship tends to break down. Yeah. So that's why it's so important. It's meeting that deep emotional need, or helping people meet that deep emotional need. And it's not only feeling love, but also giving love too, right? That's a basic yeah. need for people. Well, it's giving love to the other person because yeah. the other person has the need to feel loved. Mm-hmm. You have the need to feel loved. So learning how to speak each other's love language helps you to do that effectively. Yeah. And, you know, I think in that, you feel connected. And when you feel connected, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you start belonging, you get the physical needs, and you get the, the security needs. And belonging is such a huge part to a thriving relationship, right? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, you can have the physical needs and those other needs met, but if you don't feel loved in the relationship, it's a fractured relationship. It right. will not be a long-term healthy relationship. Now, we know that people can be married for 30 years, so they have a long-term relationship but it's not a healthy relationship yeah. if they don't feel loved. Yeah. So let's break it down for people. First and foremost, what are the five love languages? And then we'll take a deep dive into each one of them. Okay. One of them is words of affirmation, mm-hmm. simply using words to affirm the other person. Mm-hmm. Incidentally, you look nice in that outfit. Okay. <laughs> uh, giving gifts or receiving gifts. Mm-hmm. It's universal to give gifts as an expression of love. Uh, acts of service. Doing something for the person that you know they would like for you to do. The dishes. The dishes. The cooking laundry, meals. Yes. Scooping the kitty litter. Or changing the baby's diaper. Again. Ooh, big act of service. <laughs> uh, quality time. Giving them your undivided attention. Mm. And you may be carrying on conversation. You may be doing a, doing a project. But the main thing is we're together. Mm. It's that sense of we're doing this together. Yeah. And then number five is physical touch. Mm-hmm. And we've long known the emotional power of physical touch. Yes. So, I mean, well, and physical touch alone, like that, I know as a parent of two, my kids are eight and 10 years old now, but when I, uh, they were little babies, just the skin to skin touch yeah, helps absolutely. a baby know that they're safe and that they're going to be okay. And before the moments where they can actually speak and vocalize, yeah. right? Absolutely. And, you know, I think what's really interesting, so I should point out, this is the book, Five Love Languages, and I'll put a link in the show notes. So if you guys wanted to uh, click to purchase, you can do. I know this about this book. One, there has been, what, 11 million plus plus copies. 12 million now. 12 million copies sold. (laughs) In English. (laughs) I've easily bought five, if not 10 of these and given, had them myself and then gave them to friends, you know, for wedding gifts or birthday gifts because it's just 
brilliant. And the basic core premise, if I may be so bold to explain it, tell me if I'm wrong, is that every single human being on the planet has at least one primary love language. And you believe it's one of those five, right? Absolutely. And it's just, it's similar to spoken language. Mm -hmm. Everyone grows up with a language and a dialect. I grew up, for example, speaking English, mm -hmm. Southeastern style. Mm -hmm. You speak it tux, Texan style. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our native tongue. Yep. That's the one we understand best. Same thing is true with love. Mm -hmm. We have a primary love language. And if you don't speak the other person's love language, they won't quite get it. Mm -hmm. You're sincere. You're expressing love. They're not getting it emotionally because you're likely speaking your own love language rather than speaking their love language. So let's break that down as an example. Classic. I'll tell you one from my own household. I, my love language is words of affirmation. I just wish my husband, my kids, my coworkers, anybody would just say, hey, Mary, you're doing a great job. Yeah. Like, look at you do all the things. Keep going. You know, that's what yeah. I wish people would say. My husband's love language, love him to death. We've been married 14 years. His love language is acts of service. So he does the dishes, he'll do the bills, he'll do this, he'll do that, and you know, fill out all the paperwork and all that, and I do adore him for doing those things. But sometimes I just wish he would say, you're yeah. doing great, Mary. Yeah. So he's speaking acts of service, yep. which happens to be his love language, yep. which is natural. Mm -hmm. We tend to speak our own love language, but because that's not your primary love language, you appreciate it to be sure, Yep. but it doesn't meet that need to feel loved. Yeah. Uh, and simple words of affirmation would do it for you. Yeah. So if he understands that and he chooses to do it, then your love tank is full. And if you do acts of service for him, mm -hmm. <laughs> then his love tank is full. And that's the thing. That was like the light bulb moment when I was reading your book many, many, many years ago. It's like, oh, it's not just knowing what your love language is. It's knowing what your partner's is and you bounce off to him his love language, not yours. Don't keep pushing your agenda on him. Oh, that was such a classic moment for me. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. duh. Yeah. What's I've had so many people, Mary, say to me through the years, uh, five years ago, 10 years ago, seven years ago, we were next door to divorce. Mm. We just thought we were not compatible. We can't go on. And someone gave us a copy of your book mm -hmm. on the five love languages. And the lights came on. Mm -hmm. And we realized how we had missed each other emotionally. Yeah. And we started speaking each other's language, and it literally saved our marriage. Yeah. I think because this is such a deep emotional need that it can save a marriage. Mm -hmm. Because once you feel loved, you can handle the other things in life, the normal conflicts that we have. You can handle those things, the tragedies that might happen. Yeah. You can handle those if, if the two of you feel emotionally connected to each other. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important. Yeah, and I think sometimes people overcomplicate this. Um, I know, I can only speak for my own self. I overcomplicate it. I overthink it. Um, that simple acts of love, once you realize what their language is, in simple, tiny moments... You know, so I've stopped putting my hand on his shoulder, um, thinking that that would be the way to show him love. I've stopped saying nice little text messages. You know, I'll still do it, but, yeah. you know, it's not as many as often. And I'll start, hey, I'll just tidy up the, the kitchen this morning, even though that technically is your chore and responsibility. He goes, oh, thanks, Mary, for doing that. I was in such a rush this morning. Yeah. It's remembering, like the little things. Yeah, and, and you give heavy doses of the primary. Mm. You can sprinkle in the other four, get yep. a little extra credit for that. Yep. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the cherry on top of the soda. Right. <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit earlier about this concept of keeping our love tank full, and I love that analogy. Um, so imagine you're driving a car down the, the highway. If the tank is empty, you're going to crash. You're going to either fall over on the <laughs> side, right? So why is it so important to keep our own love tanks full, right? I think uh, the illustration you gave is exactly the point. Mm. That if the car has gasoline, if it's a gasoline car, yep. it's gasoline, you can drive a long ways. And when you refill it, you can drive another long ways. Yeah. I think the same thing is true with love. When in a relationship, I like to picture this emotional love tank inside. Mm. And when in the relationship, the love tank is full, the relationship continues to go and flourish. Yeah. When the love tank is empty, it doesn't flourish. It, it kind of flounders. Mm. And this is where the other aspects of life get bigger. The conflicts get bigger. Yeah. And we have a more difficulty solving the conflicts if we don't feel loved. Mm. And eventually we get to the place where we feel like, well, 
we don't even like each other anymore. Yeah. And I know because I've been there. Yeah. I remember the early days of our marriage when I just felt like I've made a mistake. And this the, is not working. And this is what sparks you to wrote, write the book all well, along, the right? Well, I think because Carolyn and I went so through so many struggles in those early years mm. and didn't know how to connect with each other and how to solve conflicts with each other and love each other, that's probably why I've done what I've done with my life. I mean, mm. it's motivated me. I have deep compassion for people who sit in my office and say, we don't have any hope. Mm -hmm. We have no hope. And eventually I say to them, you know, I can understand that. You've lost hope. So why don't you go on my hope? Mm -hmm. I have hope for you. Mm -hmm. I've been where you are, and I have hope for you. So just go on my hope. And if you're willing to try some things differently from what you've done in the past, I have hope for you, yeah. and let's see what happens. <laughs> well, and that's it. I mean, I think it's it's trying a framework, a different framework. Because I think, well, I know we'll go through this in a little bit, but you know, when when you fall out of love or you um, things get a little bit tough, it, it can be hard. You feel like you're just bashing each other in, in the face, you know. Um, and it's nice to try something different, a framework that is simple to understand, the five yeah. love languages, and also just look at what's going on in a different lens. Yeah, and I think when you do that, when you take it seriously, mm. and then you learn each other's love language, and then you choose to speak it, love is a choice. You know, the love language just gives you information. Right on how to communicate love most effectively to the other person. Mm -hmm. You have to choose to mm -hmm. learn to speak that language or not. Right. Because love is a choice. Love stimulates emotions. Mm -hmm. But the kind of love we're talking about doesn't start with an emotion. It starts with a choice. Mm -hmm. I've got information now on what would most effectively make you feel loved. Mm -hmm. So now I choose to speak it or not to speak it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, I just say to guys who sometimes say to me, well, I don't, it just doesn't come natural for me to do those things that you're asking me to do or she's asking me to do. I say, well, it may not feel natural. If you didn't receive that growing up, it will not feel natural. Yeah. But the good news is you can learn to speak any of these love languages as an adult, even if you didn't receive them as a child. Mm -hmm. It takes effort to be sure, but you can do it. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, exactly. It's just like the same as if I was to start trying to learn how to speak Japanese. I don't even know the yeah. first thing about Japanese. And yeah. it would be really difficult at first, but a little bit of practice every single day, taking lessons, reading a good book, you know, understanding yeah. that's, that's how you build a new muscle, a new, a new discipline muscle. So I'm curious then, when it comes to your love tank, is it your responsibility to keep your love tank full or is it your partner's responsibility, or is it a bit of both? In your I think, opinion? well, the deep desire to feel loved mm. is the desire to have a full love tank, if mm. we use that analogy. Yeah. But we can't fill our own love tank. Mm. We desire to be loved by other people, right. and especially the significant people in our lives, yep. which often are family, most basically family members, and then friends and work, work associates. Uh, but I think it is our responsibility to communicate to the other person what makes us feel loved. Mm -hmm. That's why I encourage couples to read the book together, take the quiz together, discover your love language together. Now both of you have the information mm -hmm. as to what would make the other person feel loved. And now you can begin to work on developing, you know, the talent of doing that. Right. And, you know, I mean, even if you said as a couple together, right, things are rocky right now but let's just commit to trying this new thing for 21 days and give it a go. And, yeah. you know, even if it feels super awkward and the words feel very stilted if you're trying to give me words of affirmation or whatever, just try, right? Yeah. That's the first yeah, step. Yeah, and, and the other thing is give the person credit. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes if they haven't been doing this, you, you say, well, in your mind, you say, well, they're just doing this because we took that quiz and we read that right. book. And so they're just, you know, they're just, doing, they won't, it won't last. Mm. You have and, to have and, an open and, mind. and that's a that's a valid concern. Will it last? Because sometimes we start things and don't follow through. Right. Uh, but you know, give them credit for it. Maybe it's yeah. It seems awkward. And sometimes you can even say, you know, honey, this seems awkward. I don't know the last time I ever told you that I love you, mm -hmm. but I do love you. Yeah. If words is their language, yeah. or I don't know how long it's been since I told you that I appreciate the fact that that you cook our meals mm -hmm. two days a week, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and it does feel a little awkward for both of you. 
But it feels really good to you if that's your love language. Mm -hmm. And if they continue to do that, it becomes more natural for them, Mm -hmm. and it's meaningful to you. Yeah, and repetition is the best way to build a muscle. (laughs) Repetition, my friends. So let's talk to those couples who might be listening to this podcast right now who are definitely feeling like they're falling out of love. They're in the danger zone. They're falling apart. They're isolated. What other bits of advice would you give them right now? Well, the first thing I would say is, it's natural and normal to fall out of love. Mm. As a matter of fact, what we typically call falling in love has an average lifespan of two years. Mm. We've studied it, some a little longer, some a little less, average two years. We come down off the euphoria of that in love experience. Oh, yes. The, uh... And our culture does not tell us that. Mm-hmm. The our tingles, co- the yeah, excitement right. are like, there's <laughs> nothing wrong with Gary. <laughs> Gary is so amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and so what I say to them is, it should help you to know mm-hmm. that it's normal to come down off the high. Yes. And so I wish I had known that. I did not know that. And mm-hmm. when I came down off the high, I began to think, I've lost it. Mm-hmm. I don't feel the way I used to feel toward her. And the things my mother told me about her before we got married were true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't listening back then. Uh, yeah, we weren't listening because in our minds, they're perfect when yeah. you're in love. So that's the first thing. Mm-hmm. And the second stage of romantic love takes far more effort and information. Mm-hmm. And that's where the love language comes in. Mm-hmm. The five love languages teaches you how to express love to your spouse in their primary love language. Yeah. Gives you that information. So now, yes, it's more effort. When you're in the euphoric stage, you're the best you're ever going to be. I mean, you do everything. You don't, no effort, you know. You don't have to work at it. But this kind of love is a choice and it does take effort. But when you do it, it touches the other person emotionally, fills their love tank. Mm -hmm. And if they reciprocate with your love language, your love tank fills up. And you hardly miss the euphoria because you still feel emotionally connected to each other. Yeah, and that what you just said just sparked me. Um, I have many pages dog-eared in this book, but this one in particular. You wrote this. Welcome to the real world of marriage, where hairs are always on the sink and little white spots cover the mirror, where discussions center not on what sh- where should we eat tonight, but why didn't you buy the milk? <laughs> <laughs> it's a world where bills and in-laws and jobs and children all clamor for our attention, a world where routine and resentment can silently eat away at the love we once had. In this world, a look can hurt and a word can crush. Intimate lovers can become enemies and marriage a battlefield. You could be a songwriter, Dr. Chapman. <laughs> if this whole writing thing I doesn't work roads, out. You write the song. <laughs> right? I think you could write songs. I mean, that you pretty much have described my marriage of 14 years right there. You know. Well, it's very true. You know, this it can become mundane. We're mm-hmm. simply doing what has to be done. We're going through the emotions. And when the children come along, sometimes we begin to focus on the children and we just simply neglect each other. Yeah. And that's where couples drift apart. And when you start drifting, you always drift apart. Yeah. We never drift together. Mm. You have to put the oars in the water if you're going to stay together. And uh, that's why it's, it's, it's so important to keep the emotional bond between the husband and the wife. It's the greatest thing you can do for your children. Yeah, because they're, they're looking to you as role models. Absolutely. They're looking at you and saying, this is what parents look like. This is what marriages look like. Yeah. And, you know, that's the hardest part, I think, about being a parent is sometimes realizing, like, okay, if, if you know, my parents were working with whatever tools they had in the 70s and 80s and their parents prior to that, but how do we break that cycle of, you know, and give our children a better role model to, yeah. to grow from and live from, you know? Yeah, because, you know, sometimes we invest so much energy in our children by the time they're 18, neglect the marriage, and, and many people actually end up divorcing after the kids go to college. Yeah. And they think, well, we got them to adulthood, and they're going to be okay now. Mm. It won't hurt them. But when I speak on college campuses about this concept, the love language concept in relationships. The students who stay afterwards and talk to me many times, many of them are Mm -hmm. students who say to me, Dr. Chapman, I don't even know where to go home anymore. My parents divorced after I came to college. Mm -hmm. My dad's here, my mom's here. I think I'll just stay at college this Christmas. Yeah. You know, don't ever think that your marriage breaking up will not affect your children. I don't care what age they are. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, they can survive, to be sure. But 
if we can understand that the greatest thing we can do for our children, and this is not the reason necessarily for doing it, but the greatest thing we can do is to give them a model of a mother and father who love each other and consequently work through their conflicts and learn how to encourage and support each other. With open communication. Absolutely. Kindness, respect. With all of that. Yeah. We're, we're, we're serving our children. Right. And they, they have the best chance to grow up and have a good marriage themselves. And generations to come. Yeah. I 100% believe in that. So I'm curious, with the book, it's definitely rooted in Christian beliefs. And, um, you know, Jesus is my jam as well. Uh, what if your spouse doesn't believe in God? Like, are there ways and, and principles in the book that we can still share with our spouse if maybe their spiritual journey is different from ours? Yeah, in fact, I wrote this book with uh, non-Christians in mind. Yeah. Because non-Christians, as well as Christians, are human. Mm. <laughs> Funny that. And from my perspective, they're made in the image of God, whether they believe it or not. They're oh. extremely valuable. I'd high-five you right now if, if yeah. we were there. <laughs> And so I really wrote this book with non-Christians in mind. Yeah. So you're not going to find a lot of religious talk in the book. I, I say to wives, don't ever ask your husband to read this whole book. Mm -hmm. Don't say, would you read this book? Mm -hmm. You say, honey, uh, would you be willing to read chapter one in this book? Mary was telling me how much it helped her and her husband. And uh, it sold over 12 million copies in English. and It's been translated in 50 languages around the world. Would you be willing to read chapter one? Just give it a go. Yeah, and tell me what you think about it. Yeah. If he reads chapter one, I can almost guarantee you he'll read the rest of the book. Yeah, and I also believe that a lot of our listeners will use different words to describe God, and I'm cool with that. Like, in my opinion, it doesn't matter what the word you use, whether it's universe or source or even love, love as God. I mean, I think it doesn't matter what religious belief or spiritual belief you have. I think the principles in this book are 100% translate. Um, because like you said, I mean, we are each expressions of love, each individuals, no matter what our belief systems are. And the greatest gift we can give to another person is the feeling of connection and love. And that's, that's everything. That's it. That's, yeah. that's the premise of the book. Yeah. And I think, you know, if somebody, a guy asked me once, he said, if I come to your marriage seminar, are you going to try to convert me? Right. I said, I don't convert people. <laughs> yeah. I said, I will tell you what it means to be a true Christian. Yeah. That's your choice to make. Yeah. Everybody has to make a choice. Yeah, we grew up, most of us grew up with some kind of religion, okay? Even if it was atheism. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a belief in something, you know. Right. And, and so we all grew up that way. We didn't choose the family we grew up in. Mm -hmm. But when we get to be adults, I think we examine the religious beliefs that we were taught as children. And, you know, my, my sense is if anybody will honestly evaluate Christianity, I don't care how they grew up, mm -hmm. they're going to see something they didn't see in their religion growing up. Yeah. Because Christianity is radically different. Mm. In most world religions, the concept is work as hard as you can to be good and to be right and to help people. And, and if there is a life beyond, you'll make it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christianity is the opposite. You don't work hard. To, to have a life with God forever. God did a lot for you to make you his child. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is accept what he's already done for you. Yeah. you know. But at any rate, yeah. that's, uh, but, uh, to, to your point, uh, this book is written to Christians and non-Christians, and it's addressing that one important but simple issue of how do you communicate love in an emotional way. Yeah. So... How can we then apply these principles in other aspects of our life? Now, I know that um, you have, I've used this, the principles here in my workplace with my coworkers and things like that. But also, I'm curious, like, I'm sure there is love, five lang love languages can translate to small children versus teenagers. How, mm -hmm. how is that different? Yeah, well, you know, you know after I wrote this book, mm -hmm. uh, the original book had a chapter on how this relates to children. Mm. And so many parents said to me, Dr. Chapman, you gave us a little bit in that book, but why don't you write a book on how this applies to children? Yeah. So I teamed up with Dr. Ross Campbell, who is mm -hmm. a psychiatrist, and he would had 30 years' experience with children. Mm -hmm. And we wrote the five love languages of children, same five love languages but how to meet the need of the child. Yeah. Uh, and what I say to parents is, the question is not, do you love your children? The question is, do your children feel loved? Yeah. 
We can be sincere in loving our children. Almost all parents love their children. But many children grow up not feeling loved. Mm -hmm. And I believe the reason is the parents missed the child's primary love language. Yep. Now, when they're little, before four ages, four years of age or younger, you give them all five. Mm -hmm. We'd like for the child to learn how to receive and give love in all five. You give them all five. But about four years of age, you can determine a child's primary love language by observing their behavior. Mm. How do they respond to you and other people? For yep. example... My son's love language is physical touch. Mm -hmm. Cuddles, When, when he was that age, yeah. I would come home in the afternoon. He would run to the door, grab my leg, and climb on me. Yeah. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Yes. My daughter never did that at that age. She would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you something. Mm. She wanted quality time. Yep. And uh, they're grown now, and that's still their love language because the love language tends to stay with us for a lifetime. Yeah. And uh, so that book has helped so many parents learn how to effectively love their children. And then I had parents say to me, okay, Dr. Chapman, the book on children really helped when they were children, but now they become teenagers and I'm doing the same thing I've always done. It doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. And they asked me, does their love language change when they get to be teenagers? And the bottom line answer is, I don't think the love language changes, but you do have to learn different dialects of their love language because what you were doing Seems childish. Mm. So you, they still need touch, but don't go out after the game and hug them in front of everybody. Mom, They'll push you so away. so embarrassing. Stop. <laughs> so you do that in private now. Yes. Or you hit them on the shoulder, you yes. know, or give them a high five or wrestle with them. Yeah. It's different kind of touches. And the same thing true with words. Yep. There are teenagers now. You don't say my sweet little thing, I love you so much, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to push you away. Uh, so I wrote a book on the five love languages of teenagers to help parents understand the mental changes, because in those teenage years, the brain's being reformed. Right. And the teenager's learning how to think logically, and they're going to question everything you say. Mm -hmm. they're, it's not that there's empty being argumentative. They're developing logical thought. So I'm trying to help them understand teenagers and what's happening and communicate love to them in a meaningful way during the teenage years. So then I'm part of the sandwich generation, which means I have children that are 8 and 10, and I also have parents who are 74 and 76 now at the time of taping, where we're caring for both. Um, how does the love languages apply to my parents? How do I love them? Yeah, well, it certainly applies because your yeah. parents have a love tank. They do. And they need to feel loved. Mm. And what I found is this. Many times I encounter single adults, sometimes married adults, who are estranged from their parents mm. because of some things that happened back in the teenage years many yeah. times. Yeah. But understanding this concept can help you perhaps reconnect with them, knowing that they have a need for love and discovering what their love language is and speaking it can really begin to build a bridge yeah. and bring healing to that fractured relationship. Yeah, that's true. It's, it's absolutely true. I, I feel now with my parents um, in their senior years, hopefully we've got quite a few more to go, um, we're starting to have new conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, when I incorporate and talk to them about this, it's, it, it starts laying down new neural pathways yeah. as well, yeah. um, which I 100% see. So how does it apply to the workplace? Well, you know, it's very interesting you ask that because through the years I've had so many people say, I know you wrote your book for marriage, mm. but I've been applying it in my work relationships. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it works. It and I works. would say, tell me your story. Tell yeah. me about it. And eventually I ended up writing a book mm. uh, with Dr. Paul White, who is a psychologist with 20 years experience in business. And uh, that book is called The Five Languages of Appreciation in the workplace, but we're simply taking the love languages to work, okay? What we found in America is that 70% of the people who have a job say they feel little to no appreciation at work. Mm. And 64% of the people who leave their job and go to another job say they left primarily because they didn't feel appreciated. Isn't that sad? It's amazing. Yeah. So this book, we're having a tremendous response to this book in the, in the, in the workplace. Now, the one place we did have pushback from the HR people mm -hmm. is physical touch. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, you we don't touch that. in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, Dr. White said to me at one juncture, maybe we should leave that out. 
Hmm. And I said, Dr. White, my, my background academically is anthropology. Yep. I did an undergrad and a master's degree in anthropology. I said, there are no human cultures where people don't touch. Mm-hmm. Now, there are appropriate touches and inappropriate touches, right. to be sure. Bump, right, A- Absolutely. High five, yeah. you know. So we, we, le- we leave it in the book, okay? Yep. But we did find this. Almost no one has physical touch as their primary appreciation language in the workplace. Mm, you know, work relationships are different from family relationships. Right. Right. And so we did find that to be true, that, mm-hmm. that, that it's, not, it's not very high on the scale. But yeah. if, So what we say basically is if you see people that hit you on the shoulder, mm-hmm. it's okay to hit them on the shoulder. Yes. You know, if they give you a high five, it's okay. but, but if they don't ever touch anybody, don't touch them. They don't touch them. <laughs> or if you happen to touch them, they stiffen up, don't ever touch them again. <laughs> yeah, which also brings back, I mean, back to the using this with your primary partnerships and relationships, the ways to find out what your spouse's love language is, is how. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it, with that particular book, when you buy the book, you get a code, and yes. you can go on and get an assessment that'll give you your primary appreciation language at work, your secondary, and your least important. Love it. Uh, with the love language book, there is a there is a, a, a profile. It's free. Yep. And you go to fivelovelanguages.com, dot com. We'll, the number we'll five. put the link down below in the show notes All right. for everybody. Yeah. And uh, there's one there for married couples. A profile. Mm-hmm. There's one for single adults. There's one for uh, uh, teenagers. Uh, there's one for military couples because we do have a military edition of this where we focus on uh, not only the love languages with uh, military illustrations, but how do you communicate love language when you're half a world away? That is so fascinating, yeah. And that book, we're getting great response from mm. military uh, yeah. families. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely go on to the website um, through our show notes, five love languages, the number five, lovelanguages.com. You can take your free um, love languages profile quiz there to try to figure it out. But also, let's say the spouse doesn't want to take the quiz. Oh, I don't know about that. It's really, um, I've heard you say before, look for the cues as to what they complain about. Yep. And then look for the cues as to what they keep doing to show their love. And that is a clue that that Absolutely. might be their love language. Observe their behavior, how, re- how they relate to other people. Mm-hmm. If you uh, see your spouse uh, always giving gifts to people, you can assume the gifts, receiving gifts is their language. Yeah. Or if they're always giving words of encouragement to other people, mm-hmm. you can assume that's their love language. Yep. If they're the kind of person that likes to spend an hour and a half at lunch talking to a friend, you can assume quality time is their language. So mm-hmm. observe their behavior. And conversely, you can do the same for yourself. Observe your behavior. Mm-hmm. And then the one you mentioned, uh, what what do they complain about most often? The complaint <laughs> yeah. reveals the love language. Yes. You know? Why don't you ever do blah, 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 blah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And then also, what do they request of you most often? Yeah. The request also reveals the love language. If they're asking for taking a walk after dinner together, that's quality time. Yeah. If they're asking for a back rub, that indicates physical touch. Right. If you get ready to go on a business trip and they say, Be sure and bring me a surprise Mm -hmm. if they're telling you gifts is their language. You put those three together, you can pretty well figure out a person's love language. It sounds like you just slow down and listen. Because I think we get so busy in our little hamster wheels of life, (laughs) we forget to slow down and actually listen to these things. So I've got a couple of questions I ask all of our guests. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Chapman, for being here with us today. Um, I could easily hold you hostage in this room and talk to you for a few hours, but I promise I won't. Um, what is maybe one book that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or maybe challenging you a bit right now? Oh, I read so many books because I have an hour-long radio program myself every yep. week in which I interview people. Uh, most of the books I read are on marriage and family, mm-hmm. and there are really some good books out there today, yeah. you know? Uh, that's why I encourage people, read one book on marriage every year the rest of your life, mm-hmm. you know? And I don't know that I would recommend one above another. It just really stands out to me. Uh, it all depends on where you are in the journey, yeah. you know? Well, how about we do this? We'll put a link down to your radio show as well, so people okay. can go ahead and tune in there also. So also, tell us one person that you think, um, either in your network or people that you know, that you think we should interview on the Simplifiers podcast and why. You know, uh, the gal that comes to my mind is Arlene Pelicane. Mm. Arlene and I wrote a book together called Growing Up Social, Mm -hmm. Raising Relational Kids in a Screen-Driven World. This is a huge topic and huge importance today. But she's written other books as well. Uh, she's a delightful lady, uh, 
And I think your your listeners uh, would really love being introduced to Arlene Pelican. Great speaker as well as a great writer. Brilliant. We will definitely have her on the podcast soon. So, Dr. Chapman, um, gratitude and simplicity, in my mind, go hand in hand. Tell us what's the one thing you're grateful for right now in your life. I'm grateful that my wife is alive. Hmm. Yeah. Six years ago, she had cancer. Yeah. Went through a year, a whole year, had chemotherapy and all of that. You know, lost her hair. Yeah. Just you know, but she came through it. It's been six years now, and she's doing great. Right. And uh, goes back every year for a checkup, and she's doing great. Just grateful. You know, when you when you come next door to death, the appreciation for each other is even deeper. Mm-hmm. You know, and so yeah, if I had to say one thing. That's what I'm grateful for. Brilliant. So again, just to remind you guys, you can check out Gary Chapman, um, find his book everywhere, um, but go, definitely go to his website, fivelovelanguages.com to learn more about his brilliance and work. Um, and really, this is your life's work, isn't it? This message that... It is. You know, that book uh, is obviously the best-selling book. You know, we have a whole mm-hmm. series on different yeah. aspects of the love languages, but many of my other books have so well, well where I deal with other issues, yeah. you know, like... What to do when your marriage is falling apart. Mm-hmm. You know, one more, one more try. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. My, so I think at that website, they will find books wherever they are in the journey. They're probably going to find one of my books because I've been counseling now for over 40 years, you know. Time. And so uh, in my writing, I simply tried, it's the overflow of what I've discovered in the counseling office. Well, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you. If no one else has ever acknowledged you in the last couple of months, just to say, I appreciate you. Uh, You, again, have fundamentally enriched my life, even though we've not met before today. There are thousands, I'm willing to bet, even millions of people out there that are just like me that have said the same thing. Um, So thank you. Thank you for being courageous and saying these words and putting them into a book and spreading the word. all around the world. Please. Well, thank you, Mary. Yeah. I appreciate that. And it's good to be with you. Keep yeah. up the good work. Thank you. What's your love language, by the way? Words of affirmation. Ah, you I just got gave it. it to me. Yes. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Chapman, my very last question to you is this. Um, somebody who's been listening to this episode today has giggled and laughed alongside us, but then also something sparked a little light bulb in her head and maybe she's married maybe she's going through a real rough patch right now in her marriage what's one thing that you could just whisper into her ear right now to encourage her in this moment I think I would say no matter how dark it looks make a real effort to discover your husband's love language Mm -hmm. maybe with those three questions that we gave and then start speaking it consistently at least once every week and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. You see, love stimulates love. I know you don't feel like doing it. If you're you're in a dark place, you don't feel like loving them. Yeah. Because you've been hurt, perhaps. But if you choose to speak love in their love language consistently over a period of time, I'd say say make a six-month experiment of it. For six months, no matter how they treat you. I'm not talking about abuse. Right. You know, but... You speak their love language, and you see what happens. And there's a good chance that because you're speaking their love language, their love tank is filling up, you can make requests of them, and they'll begin to respond to your request. And they'll break that wall down every so bit. Absolutely. Dr. Chapman, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I enjoyed it.